Die Sprachübertragung beginnt jetzt. Alle Teilnehmer befinden sich im Zuhörermodus. Hello and good morning from Bonn at this autumnal October day, dear ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michael Bommer and I would like to welcome you to our today's webinar on the Article 8 uh, um, Taxonomy Delegated Act Reporting for NFRD Investors and Alternative Investments. Just some technical information at the beginning. As usual, you will get a copy of the slides afterwards as well as a recording to watch in on demand if ever. And more important, if you have any questions, you might ask them in this GoToWebinar tool in the upper right corner of your screen. Feel free to ask questions via the tool also in between. Today's webinar is a fruit of our ESG activities. So a little advertising is in order at the beginning. I will tell you briefly about more about our ESG activities, which are in the area the following one. We have a permanent working group on sustainable finance and ESG, in which we prepare our opinions for consultations on all levels, and which is also a platform for dialogue and exchange of information. Members of this working group formed the nucleus of the BAI PAI best practices roundtables, where we discuss almost every two weeks the specific problems and topics for illiquid asset classes like private equity, private debt, um, real estate and infrastructure. We offer BAI webinars on ESG topic like this one and also workshops in presence on ESG topics. Via uh, informal and newsletter, we inform also our members on all uh, topics and um, which I want to show you um, specifically, we have also our member portal um, introduced uh, one year um, um, before this webinar. So let's uh, have a short look on our BAI member portal. If you are logged in, you can see at the left side our various subgroups, such as the taxonomy and the SFDR group, but also the EET group, which has developed the template in discussion today. This group is co-headed by Jegor Tokarevich. So move to the next slide. Beat is in this web member portal, be it by email, be it here in the webinar, Jäger and I will collect every uh, feedback you probably might uh, give to us. Uh, and on this reporting template, we will um, show us today and subsequently um, send them consolidated to Findatex. Just a bit more advertising before we start. Here's a look at our future events in present. So this week on Thursday, we uh, have our BAI Real Asset Symposium in Frankfurt. And in nearly one month, we have our ESG workshop on sustainable finance and ESG with a great again, agenda and great speakers, which will be published in the coming weeks. Via the link um, uh, on this slide, you can also find all our planned webinars in the coming weeks. Today's speakers are the following one. So we have uh, first Igor Tokarevich, who is uh, um, our co-head of our working groups on investor regulations and sustainable finance in ESG, and his civil life CEO from Substance Over Form, a risk and reporting uh, service provider focused on risk management and reporting, including, including ESG reporting for alternative investments and regulated institutional investors such as insurers, pension funds, asset managers. What he's doing on his job, he teaches also at the University of Oldenburg. Jäger is a member of the EU-wide uh, Findatex Working Group, developing the Solvency 2 reporting template, also known as the TPT. As you know, the ET has been developed according to this model. So we have the next um, uh, Anja Till Bollmann and Marian Pinov from the German insurance group Alte Leipziger Hallesche. Maria is working in the investment management control department and uh, oversees the establishment and development of regulatory reporting for sustainability and is also a key point for, uh, of contact for data analysis for monitoring the group's sustainability strategy. 
Anja is an in-house lawyer within the group and responsible for both sustainability of the group's assets and sustainability related matters in a group's in-house fund management company. All in all, a trio of speakers with a lot of practical experience from many perspectives, which also characterizes the work of the BAI, asset manager, investor, and service provider. Having said that, I hand over to you, Igor. Um, the screen and the microphone are yours. Thank you. Yes, Michael, thanks a lot for the presentation and the intro. Um, hello, everyone, and happy Monday. It's great to have you here. Um, I can see we currently have over 150 uh, participants who joined, so the topic seems to be of relevance for you, which is great. Um, so let's um, um, let's maybe have a look at the agenda, what we are going to do. So first of all, I'll start with a couple of introductionary remarks about uh, Article 8 and why it's important. And then, and this is why I also would like to immediately say thanks to um, Anya Timbolna and Marian Pinov. We'll have a opportunity to actually listen to um, exact insights um, of an NFRD investor, um, um, in this case, um, um, Alte Leipziger Hallescher, large German insurance group, who will tell us um, a little bit about um, how they see it from their perspective and what they require from GPs, so from asset managers and service providers, when they invest in alternative investments. And after that, we'll show an example, especially relevant for this year, regarding a potential template for the Article 8 taxonomy reporting. So now um, let me uh, start with what we are, whom and uh, uh, what we're actually talking about. And you can see here on in the middle um, that you have certain investors who are European, so EU-based financial investors. And usually um, we, we refer to NFRD investors um, as um, um, uh, companies who are um, especially insurance companies, credit institutions, and asset managers with over 500 employees, but also fulfilling certain further criteria in terms of net uh, turnover and um, balance sheet. So there are a couple of um, investors, especially insurance companies. And what's happened uh, this year, they reached out to the um, industry and they said, we actually need to report taxonomy alignment and uh, based on this regulation and uh, we don't have uh, a template right now to report um, and that's why um, what, what, what motivated us to basically uh, catch up with um, um, with the industry including actually Leipzig again develop something and and, and uh, yeah, uh, present it in this webinar today so right now as we said um, um, Predominantly, those insurance companies, credit institutions, and asset managers with over 500 employees. However, as you know, there will be um, also uh, a CSRD, and the CSRD will, um, as you can see here, now I should see my pointer. The CSRD will um, um, come into force from 2025. So um, um, this will also lower the threshold. So you'll have much more investors for whom it's relevant, um, and because also financial institutions with less than 250 employees uh, will be um, um, in scope of CSRD. So you'll have more investors, more LPs for whom this will be relevant. So what do they have to do um, under the NFRD and Article 8 taxonomy delegated um, 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 regulation? What they need to do is essentially they need to collect taxonomy eligible and taxonomy aligned data and disclose it as part of their non-financial reporting on the website. And um, this is nothing new, to be honest, because this has been happening for the previous years as well. Um, the non-financial reporting um, and was um, focusing on a taxonomy eligibility only in the last two years. However, now in 2023, the first is the first time where taxonomy alignment has to be reported as well, and also additional um, KPIs regarding nuclear and gas um, um, taxonomy extensions. So this is why. We're not talking about something completely new. It's just that in the last two years, what has been happening was much lower in terms of uh, the requirement, um, um, which uh, today is, um, or for this year, is the first time it's extended to, like we said, taxonomy alignment and significantly more KPIs that have to be reported. So this is why 2023, let's say, is the first year of um, extensive reporting compared to the last two years. And what will happen is that the, the um, LP, so the financial investor, will disclose the taxonomy alignment uh, KPIs in their non-financial reporting on the website. And then, um, as you can see here, everyone will be able to access it. 
So the supervisors will see it, um, auditors obviously already before uh, the disclosure, but also the competitors, newspapers, research, and so on. So it will be something um, 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 what is intended to provide more transparency. And interestingly enough, last uh, week, I actually had a chance to talk to the um, uh, to various members of the EU platform for sustainable finance, especially those who um, um, actually had uh, uh, different subgroups uh, on the conference. And I asked, is it really something what you think will help um, what will help us, you know, to tackle uh, climate uh, change uh, and the climate crisis, but also other topics? So is this really something what, you know, uh, thousands of data points and disclosure requirements is something what will you know help us uh, uh, surviving let's say and we become a zero as a as a as a sector but also as, as, as a world and they said yes we think we think so they said our view is uh, data helps so uh, um, um, i think the this uh, short answer uh, shows that uh, uh, this is the you know the mindset of the european commission they do want to um, they do want to create reporting requirements because they think once we have data once we have disclosure requirements it will help uh, stakeholders um, thinking in the, let's say, in, in, in a sustainable way and, and making decisions in a sustainable way. So that's a bit of the, the, the motivation for this whole regulations here. Um, and now the big question is now imagine you're an, you're an insurance company like the colleagues we have here and you need to disclose it. Uh, you need to disclose a lot of data points. How do you get the data, especially how do you get the data from alternative investments? So you would reach out to alternative investment funds and ask them for providing this data. Um, this is obviously um, how you do it already for TPT, for Solvency 2, for VAG, for CRR, for um, uh, for ESG, so for, uh, via the EET and PAIs and so on. Uh, and now obviously you need to do exactly the same. The only question is which template and uh, do we use and how do we do this? So that a bit of as a starting point for the motivation of this um, webinar. Now um, we move on, and again I encourage you also to type your questions into the chat, as uh, Michael mentioned at the beginning, if there are any, so that we'll always uh, take some in between. So now let's move on and see how it looks like. So don't be scared by this. I'll explain it, and it will be much uh, much easier, um, I hope, um, after I explain it. So. How does it work? Essentially, how it works is that the taxonomy reporting has two parts. One is the mandatory reporting, and the other one is the voluntary. And in the mandatory reporting, you're only allowed to report something which, which comes from official NFRD reports of target companies. So imagine you have a portfolio company. Let's say it's a private equity company. If this private equity company is an NFRD company, so it's also in scope of NFRD, and publish a certain taxonomy data, you're allowed to use this data. If it's not, you're not allowed to use this data in the mandatory reporting, but you're allowed to use it as an estimate. So if you have some sort of estimate, if they report something else, not for an NFRD report, in the voluntary reporting. So what does it mean? It means that in the mandatory reporting, the scope of, let's say, eligible data sources is rather small because I can only get data from NFRD companies. And by NFRD companies, I do not mean NFRD asset managers. I mean NFRD companies after looking through a fund. So if you have a fund, it's managed by a company, so by, by an AFM, let's say. We're talking about the NFRD companies in the fund. So let's say you have 10 fintechs or 10 bakeries in the fund. So we're talking about each of them. And if one of them has, um, um, if one of them is NFRD in scope of NFRD, the data they report is something which we are allowed to use in the reporting. If they're not in scope of NFRD, we're not allowed to use it in the mandatory reporting, but we may use it in the voluntary reporting. So I think the most, um, 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 probably the most, let's say, uh, drastic example is in the case of an infrastructure fund. So let's say you are an onshore wind farm, uh, a wind fund, and under SFR, uh, SFDR, you think that um, you report, uh, so you're, let's say, 90% taxonomy aligned um, under SFDR, and that's okay, because under SFDR, you don't have this requirement. Um, however, uh, since most infrastructure SPVs are not in scope of NFRD, uh, none of them would be reported as taxonomy aligned or eligible in the mandatory reporting. So a typical typical infrastructure equity fund with non uh, NFRD SPVs um, in, in renewables would report 0% in taxonomy eligibility and taxonomy alignment. However, they are allowed to use this knowledge of 
potential taxonomy eligibility and alignment, um, even if they're not in FRD, in the voluntary reporting. So that's a bit of the mindset of um, of the Article 8 taxonomy reporting. It is very different, and this is important to understand, it's very different from SFDR and the SFDR disclosures, because the SFDR disclosures have completely different requirements. And even and it's not really it's not really helpful to be honest, because on the one hand side, you have SFDR with certain taxonomy reporting, but this is not the same taxonomy reporting as what you have under NFRD. So you may have two different taxonomy reportings, which are diverging under SFDR and NFRD. So uh, that's the world we basically are um, are living in at the moment. So how does it look like concretely? Let's have a couple of examples and do not think this is, um, um, uh, let's say this is how it always is. It's just a typical example, let's say. So in the public space, I would say it's rather easy because in the public space, the data comes from a service provider usually uh, uh, who collect this data. So you can see immediately, is it an FRD or not? Um, estimates are usually not reported. So whatever you have in the public space in the mandatory reporting, you would also have in the voluntary reporting. So in this case, we have, let's say, a public equity or debt portfolio, and um, let's say 65% eligible to 25% are aligned, all coming from 65% um, um, or, or more, maybe even more uh, percent of um, um, a higher proportion of NFRD companies. So whatever you have here, you would also have in the voluntary part. Why? Because the process is the same. So there is no sort of additional estimate. So whatever you get from NFRD companies, the service provider would usually take, the, comp the, the, the LP would get it and then report it, and that's it. Um, now let's have a look at the private markets. In the private market space, you don't have a, a typical... Uh, so first of all, you don't have many NFRD companies, and second, you don't have a large uh, reporting uh, sort of data provider um, um, like you have in the public space. So um, how does this work? So let's have a look at private equity, private debt. So let's assume it's exactly the same portfolio, so similar companies. They also have maybe 65% and 25% eligible, but none of them are NFRD. So what will happen is because none of the portfolio companies are NFRD regulated, the taxonomy eligibility and alignment will be reported as zero because the portfolio companies of this private equity and that portfolio and fund are not in scope of NFRD. However, under SFDR, they may report that uh, you know they also have 65% of eligible activities and 25% of aligned. So what will they do? Um, they may still report this data because they want to show that they may be green. Uh, so in the voluntary reporting, the, 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 the LP would be able to consider this data. But in the mandatory, not because they're not an in scope of NFRD. Uh, now let's move on to infrastructure equity and debt. And this is exactly the example of what I, what I said before. That's a typical Article 9 plus uh, uh, fund, um, um, an onshore wind equity fund, let's say. So 95%, so apart from cash and derivatives, would be taxonomy eligible. So essentially almost the whole fund. And maybe 85% would even be taxonomy aligned. And uh, um, in the voluntary reporting, they would be able to report it. But in the mandatory, it would be all zero because all the SPVs are non, in, not in scope of NFRD. So that's essentially uh, the, let's say, um, uh, unfortunate dilemma for, for, for especially renewables equity infra uh, funds, because in the current NFRD reporting, they would be reported as zero uh, in the mandatory one. But in the vol voluntary, they would still be able to show the potential taxonomy eligibility and alignment. Now, last but not least, real estate. So real estate, what's the difference for real estate as opposed to public equity, private equity, and infrastructure? They're not companies. So in real estate, you would usually have a, um, you have a specific category. And our understanding here is that real estate would be reported at other items. It's also something we discussed with um, um, at least some auditors. So this NFRD requirement would not really, so NFRD source would not really um, apply here. So in this case, our understanding is in the real estate equity and debt universe, it should still be possible to report uh, uh, eligibility and alignment in the mandatory and in the voluntary reporting as well. So long story short, what would I like to say here is that there are two reports what you should keep in mind, mandatory and voluntary. In the mandatory, only NFRD um, um, entries uh, or NFRD issuers um, data is allowed to be used. Um, it has nothing to do with SFDR. And this is why the Article 8 taxonomy reporting is very different from the SFDR taxonomy alignment reporting. Um, so that is the what. So now um, you should know, you remember in my uh, previous, um, in my previous slide, on my previous slide, one second. Just trying to go back here. Oh, 
Oh, okay, there we go. Okay, so in my previous slides, I showed you that um, it's not just insurance companies, it's also credit institutions and asset managers who need to report it. So what is important to know is that each of those institutions have a different annex they have to disclose. And that makes it a bit more difficult, unfortunately. So in KI, for instance, everyone has the same KI statement, which is great. Uh, not an article eight taxonomy. So here, insurance need to, for example, report uh, uh, annex ten and twelve, but then credit institutions and asset managers have different annex that they have to report. So each type of an um, um, investor need to report something different here. So that's that's a bit of the unfortunate uh, uh, part here. Um, so uh, now in this in this webinar, since we have insurance companies, uh, um, um, insur insurance company colleagues with us will focus on insurance companies, but bear in mind, uh, credit institutions and asset managers may need something else. And we start here with the insurance companies and insurance companies, that's what they have to report. They have to report the Annex 10 and Annex 12. So this is Annex 10 is the main Annex. And as you can see here, this is how, if you open the regulation, that's what you will find there. So this is what they need to disclose on the website in 2024 for the year 2023. And if we break it down, you'll see that it's, 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 there are two parts they need to report. One is the so-called denominator, another on the numerator. In the denominator, you need to show two main parts. One is the split by asset types. And this has nothing to do with taxonomy alignment or eligibility. So this is something, it's just the portfolio. So you can see here what which kind of portfolio types do we have here. So instrument classes, we have derivatives, we have other counterparties, including real estate, according to our understanding, and you have companies. And then in companies, you have a lot of different subclasses, like subject to NFRD, non-subject to NFRD, then financial, non-financial, non-EU financial, non-financial, and so on. So you have a couple of breakdowns. But I think the most important part here is that this, everyone has to report regardless of if you are taxonomy aligned, non-taxonomy aligned, and so on. Uh, then you also have a split by taxonomy. So here you need to report if it's eligible and aligned, eligible, not aligned, and not aligned. So that's essentially the, the, the split by taxonomy. And also this, again, has some subcategories like uh, turnover and CAPEX related because they, under the taxonomy you need to report both. That's essentially how the denominator is um, uh, reporting is structured. And then you have the numerator and the numerator is um, an, again split by taxonomy whereby you're only so in the numerator you can only have nfrd uh, um, entries and for companies so what you have here is uh, you see is a split by financial non-financial again turnover capex uh, other assets turnover capex and then you also have additional breakdowns by environmental goals um, um, so by not by climate goals actually by environmental goals one to six and then you have also additional breakdown that traditional enabling to another topics and so on. So you have quite a few data points here. And I think the important part here is to know that um, if you look at it at a denominator numerator, that um, you now you would say, I do not do taxonomy as a GP. You might say, I'm, I'm not related to, to taxonomy. I have nothing to do with taxonomy. I don't do taxonomy. However, the investor will still need it, even if you don't do taxonomy, because in the split by asset types, for example, everyone would be able to report something. So let's say you're a private equity fund with no taxonomy, uh, but you may still have 2% of your assets as derivatives. You may still have, let's say, 5% uh, as maybe some receivables and so on. And then you still have here some um, uh, uh, companies uh, which are maybe uh, non-FRD, and then some of them are financial, some non-financial, some non de use. So this, this, this would not be all zero. You would also have values which are not zero here any fund would have it right and then of course if you are uh, if you do not if you're not in, in under nfrd and um, um, then um, everything as you see here would be non-eligible non-aligned so you would have 100 percent here and and all those values would be zero and also here everything would be zero because the numerator the taxonomy aligned numerator would be zero so this is a bit different for let's say prior, uh, for a real estate fund because as we said real estate fund is not you have real estate assets or real assets they're not eligible uh, or they can be eligible per se so what you can have here is you'll have a couple of more values here because uh, real estate can be um, eligible uh, um, um, and uh, not aligned and some may even be aligned so you would, we would expect a couple of more data points here or, or, or field data um, here so long story short um, as you can see in the um, um, uh, just saying that everything is zero is not really true because the split by asset types and the split by asset times you will still have um, um, uh, some values for any fund. So any fund, NFRD, non-FRD, EU, non-EU, uh, regulated, not regulated, would, would, would fill something here. 
And if none of if you have non FRD companies and also um, none of them are maybe taxonomy aligned and or um, 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 eligible, you will still be able to populate this 100% and, and, and zero here. So this is for the article for the Annex 10. Um, on top of that, you have Annex 12 for insurance companies, which is this. So it's a further breakdown. And now you would say, what is this here? Are 4.26, 4.31. So those are the newly introduced uh, gas and nuclear activities in the taxonomy. So those are additional activities. And um, again, um, the, the, what does the regular want to see there? They want to see out of those taxonomy aligned and eligible activities, which part of this is essentially nuclear and gas. So they want to have the subset of, 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 of activities um, as nuclear and gas. And again, you have a, a whole bunch of additional data points, like over 100 data points here with breakdowns by climate change mitigation, adaptation, um, and so on um, um, for aligned activities, eligible, not aligned, and non-eligible. So you have a whole bunch, again, of all possible data points in the denominator, and the same for the numerator. Uh, and this looks like this here. So this is um, one of the tables. There are multiple tables, and that's one of the tables here. So that is essentially for an insurance company, those two um, annexes is what the insurance company needs to disclose. So they need this data from the GP because otherwise how they should be, how should they be able to disclose this data? Um, so this regarding the theory of the um, reporting that we need to report. Michael, do we have any questions so far or any remarks? No, right? So far, so, Not so far. Perfect. Yeah. Great, okay, so then, Let's move on. Um, and again, any questions from us, please ask. Um, let's move on to uh, uh, the uh, 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 timeline, because one thing is, what do I have to report and to whom? But then also the question is, when do I have to report it? And um, this, again, is a bit different from the what you usually know from EET and SFDR, because now uh, investors have um, a process where they need to, which is tied to their annual reporting cycle. Um, and usually, what happens is that uh, the auditors would come uh, from, from what we understand from different uh, conversations, the auditors would, would, would come to the company around um, uh, February and March. So by February and March, everything already shall be prepared. And this is why mostly in investors would ask for um, an input around end of January and mid-February, because this is the latest, let's say, point of time where they still be able to, to, to use the data in their annual um, um, report so in the non-financial report as part of the annual report and this is different from the EET because the EET in the institutional space is usually driven by the PII requirement and as you know the PII requirement has to be reported by the 30th of June and um, um, this is why investor specific deadlines are usually somewhere between March and May so PII you would usually need to report via EETs between March and May from our experience but the article 8 taxonomy DA is usually faster and has to be reported by January and February 24 for the year 23. So now we are all in the alternative investment space here. What does it mean? It means that um, uh, usually we don't even have an NAV as of the um, end of January. So what happened already in the last two years, what usually happens is that you would have either some sort of fast closes of the Q4 or you would, you would use the previous data which is the 30th of September, obviously. So you would take the 30th of September balance sheet, and then based on this balance sheet, provide the data. Um, and now this brings me to the next question, how do we provide this data? And the answer is, I can tell you how not to provide this data, is not via the EET, because the EET has different data points and cannot be used, uh, unfortunately, for now, at least. And uh, uh, why can't it be used? Well, because there are not the data points we need, Point number one, the timeline we saw is usually different. And the methodology for calculation is different. So in the EET, you'll have SFDR taxonomy data points. But as you remember, uh, SFRD, uh, sorry, um, um, and, and, the, and, and in the, in the um, uh, NFRD, so in the NFRD, we need, we have different reporting requirements than under SFDR. So under SFDR, what you get there, you can't use for the taxonomy reporting. And this is why um, the EET is something which can't be used for this purpose right now. Um, what we did is um, we suggested new data points as part of the EET, or at least as a separate template on the on the FinDatex uh, level, on the EU level. You can find it on the BAI website. It's 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 um, uh, free uh, freely available. Um, and uh, since there is nothing there in place, but the reporting has to be done in a couple of months, 
we basically came up with a template that we'll introduce later. Uh, but for now, um, I think that is the background. I hope it was helpful to understand where we're coming from and why what the rationale is for this for this for this um, uh, webinar here. And uh, I will hand over to uh, Anya and Marian in a second. But before this happens, um, I would like to maybe have a quick break for 10, 20 seconds and give an opportunity to ask any questions for the, let's say, theoretical background first before we move on to the practical insights. So, so any questions just answer question. them. Yeah. Yes, enter them in the chat box tool um, on the right upper corner. So far, there are no questions. So. Okay, no questions, which either means it's all well known, which is great, which means insurance companies will get a lot of data for 2023, or the opposite is the case. We'll we'll find out, I guess. So um, in the meantime, um, in the meantime, I would um, 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 I'm then very excited to hand over to uh, uh, my colleagues Anja and Marian from um, Ajayatiga Halesha, and it would be great to 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 hear now how it actually works on the insurance side on the LP side and what exactly is what exactly is happening on the investor side and with that in mind uh, Anya I think over to you I'll just switch to the next slide yes N yes um I would like to talk about uh, why the taxonomy report is so important for NFID investors especially in Germany and um when you look on a legal pers pers perspective and what happened if the requirements are not met completely and or correctly? As it uh, was said before, according to uh, Article 8 of the taxonomy regulation, companies subject to the NFRD have to disclose information on the extent of taxonomy uh, compliance of the company's activities in their non-financial reporting. This is the thing. So. Um, the non-financial reporting is a part of the annual financial statement of companies with more than 500 employees. Um, this includes most of the insurance companies in Germany. And um, the non-financial reporting is statutory reviewed in Germany by the external auditor. The auditor has to hand over his review report to the supervisory authority and so the supervisory um, authorities informed of the auditor's findings. Findings can lead to measures um, by the supervisory, supervisory authorities or to reputational damages also. Next slide, please. So, um, uh, yet now uh, the question is, what can be the consequences of auditors' findings? For, for this, we have to uh, get into the German legislation and um, the, um, the German legislator implemented the NFID in the German commercial code. And uh, this, uh, in the commercial code, um, there are regulation, the regulations define a reporting framework with minimum content for the non-financial reporting. Violations of these requirements for the preparation of a non-financial statement are sanctioned by criminal and administrative offenses. And there is the criminal liability of members of the representative body or the supervisory body if the uh, company's circumstances are misrepresented or concealed. Another sanction is, uh, will be an administrative offense if the, if the regulations on the preparation of the report are violated. Therefore, completeness and correctness is required by the supervisory authority in this context, especially for the taxonomy reporting. So then I would like to hand over to my colleague, Marianne. So what, what does the auditor requires on data quality? The auditor has to give a proof of evidence uh, that the data are complete and correct. So usually we 
would try to get uh, data from a data provider that may be an external or internal. If it's an internal, that's clear that adequacy and effectiveness of these data and uh, uh, has to be shown. But even if it's an external data provider, a commercial one, uh, we have to show this to, this to the auditor and the auditor has to certify it. So this is nearly, most of this is only paper. Therefore, the, the uh, auditor also has to has to be to the auditor has to be shown that even the reporting corporation, the insurance company, has to show that he uh, the insurance company is required to uh, show that the data provider delivers uh, correct data. Uh, this can only be uh, exculpated in the case that uh, the data provider itself can show that it is certified uh, by an independent audit from a third party. Uh, that is temporarily not the case for most of the uh, data providers. So if, if the auditor comes up with a negative notice, notice uh, in case of an audit impediment, then we are quite in a heavy problem. <laughs> so, and that means an audit impediment means that the auditor, we can, we as a reporting company, the insurance company as a reporting company cannot demonstrate that, that may be an incomplete or incorrect uh, data uh, or the use of data does not result in a material misstatement. That means that the evidence turns around that we have to bring the, or, uh, the evidence to the auditor that all the data used are correct and complete. I think it's quite a heavy duty. Uh, not only the auditor is interested in correct and complete data, but even the supervisory authority, which is the BaFin on a national level and the IOPA on a European level. Um, first bullet point is a kind of relaxation from the BaFin given to German reporting entities that if public data is not available from a, from a, uh, a company obliged to report on NFRD, then we may use our data directly obtained from these companies. So I've, I have a call with our uh, investor relation department or uh, uh, with, with, uh, with one from the press department and uh, try to receive this data and then I can use this data if I can't receive it directly from a company's report or if I I can only I can also use a third party provider. But uh, Buffin set very strict requirements to the auditors who are approving our uh, reports, uh, especially to prevent greenwashing. This is even done by fund investment uh, um, industry, but it's coming up uh, to the in, uh, insurance industry as well, and the. Uh, supervisor commits the auditor to assess and ascertain the completeness and accuracy of the information and that shall be done by uh, by a supported audit of the IT system and the functionality of this IT system and that uh, should be supported by data samples from this IT system uh, and these calculations. So as uh, Jigo just mentioned, there is uh, the obligation to report under Annex 10 and Annex 12. Annex 10 is a special report solely, uh, solely uh, to the statement is solely given by insurance companies and Annex 12 is given by every type of co company. And I made a hard copy here for from Annex 10 as Annex 10 contains 88 indicators where 80 indicators of these report are quite similar or identical to an Annex 4 report. An Annex 4 report is a report related to asset management corporations 
obliged to report under NFRD. These are the bigger ones, just familiar with this topic. So there is an interconnectivity between these indicators, only some very special uh, insurance indicators cannot be provided by by asset management companies because they don't don't know the, the final beneficiaries of these investments. Annex 12 contains 166 indicators. This is only turnover based indicators and only for uh, the climate objectives uh, one and two and maybe further indicators may follow or may be required by the auditors. Ingrid, may I ask a question here because you're saying that Annex 4 is required for asset managers. So does it mean that if you have an asset manager uh, managing a fund you invest into and the asset manager already has to report themselves for them based on Annex 4? Yeah, the asset manager, well, if, if he's if he's obliged to report uh, under NFRD an asset manager, he has to report about all his funds, all his funds he's uh, producing for for investors. And we have that just had several talks to to big asset management corporations, and I will mention it on the next slide <laughs> that these Super, asset okay. manager managing corporations just provide on a single fund basis as well as for as or they're preparing for uh, to to provide data on a single fund basis as well as for all the funds which is their own obligation great thank you yeah maybe we can mm -hmm. switch over so poor poor insurance investor knew know how he has to get the data from or where he has to get the data from there one op one opportunity is to receive data from a commercial data render but these data are more about the uh, pub from from public uh, uh, corporations and liquid assets as usually stock companies and uh, big bond issuers so these data are obtained from uh, Annex 2, from all these NFRD obliged corporations. They are collected by a data provider and maybe a data provider can also deliver some data about investment funds if these funds are public investment funds and there's a look through to these data funds. But we had discussions with several data providers. They are from this at this stage they are not a, not in a possession to deliver this data but they are preparing heavily to to live, deliver data for investment funds with a look through for public investments for, for investments in public corporations so for investment products there's a report uh, called uh, European ESG template from the Findetex group but as uh, Igor mentioned these uh, report is uh, primarily set up for SFDR reporting for the product reporting and does not contain the taxonomy data required by article 8 and even in the Findetex group as far as we can notice there is some hindering to report uh, new data in the short term. So there's a discussion, but this discussion does some, see some obstacles uh, to, to provide in the short term additional data points and additional amendments. So finally, for our illiquid assets for our uh, infrastructure or private equity investments, as well as for uh, some real estate investments, we have to contact the asset managers, the general partners, that they can provide us the data where no external, external data provider uh, delivers such kind of data. And uh, some of uh, these asset managers, the, the bigger ones, just report or just pre pre prepare their reports uh, according to Annex 4 for all investment funds and um, we had uh, discussions and uh, an exchange and uh, uh, some workshops with some of them uh, that they are able to provide uh, uh, an, an Annex 10 
sim similar to an annex four for single investment funds or for trans tranches of single investment funds. So by the end, uh, the asset managers are not willing to fill in uh, lots of questionnaires or templates from different investors for every uh, every insurance company is, who's requesting the data. And on the other side, the insurance companies, as we are, are not willing to receive different formats and different types of uh, reports in all the formats from all the different asset managers. So, so by the end, we have to try to reach out to a single uh, format to to uh, to get it into our um, data interfaces and to run our own calculations and to produce our own reports. So there's a limited uh, capacity to to cope with different formats. And uh, finally, the industry as, at its best would would be it would be great to have an, a uniform uh, format to exchange these data as we have with the TPT or with the with the FE, with the EET for the product reporting and for the comply declaration. Great, thank you very much, Anya and Maria. I think this explains uh, um, a lot, uh, let's say, as a case study, where the requirement comes from and uh, what kind of challenges an insurance company needs to um, overcome in order to be compliant with the Article 8 taxonomy DA requirement. So now, um, the situation we were in, uh, uh, this, um, it, as um, BAI was that multiple members received requests from NFRD investors, so insurance companies who need to do exactly this, uh, predominantly to provide this data. And uh, the problem was that uh, there was no format for this. So uh, um, there was no, you know, uh, uh, machine readable um, uh, format uh, um, in a way that an EET or a TPT is, for instance. Um, so um, it was also clear that um, there will also probably not be not going to be any format by the end of the year, especially on the EU FinDepex level. Uh, as uh, Maren mentioned before, uh, the topic has been raised, but uh, it was let's say there was no reliable timeline that something was going to happen so we need to do something as bai uh, we need to do something because investors need data um, uh, gps need to report something uh, and obviously if everyone reports in a different format um, it will not be helpful for anyone so we came up with something as a suggestion to findatrix in the first place as bai uh, hoping that this will be used for a later extension of an EET or as, as, as a FinDatex template, let's say. But for this year, that's, in our opinion, the what, what basically exists uh, or what can be used for the reporting for the year 2023. And then hopefully it will be used as a basis then for the next years as well. So how does it look like? The template, by the way, is something you can download for free uh, on the BAI website, um, um, as well as our uh, comments uh, to FinDatex and our suggestions to include it in in the EET. And um, as if you look at it, um, it's there's going to be a lot of fields, obviously, because Marian showed you before that uh, there are many data points. So it's not that you know the template is complicated, the regulation is complicated. So we can't you know um, we can't um, reduce the amount of data points because the, the amount of data points is given by the regulators. So essentially the only thing we did, and it was no rocket science, we just copied and pasted all data points that we found in the regulation, because that's what uh, insurers need. And essentially how it works is if you open the template, you'll see two tabs. One is the Article 8 report specifications. This is uh, basically a technical guidance on how to populate every single field. And the other one is an example of a report. So this is how a report should look like. Um, and if you look at the specifications, we have a whole bunch of fields here and I think what is important to know is that you remember we spoke about it at the beginning there is a mandatory and the voluntary part so the voluntary part essentially is just a, exactly the same as mandatory so in case you want to also disclose data in addition to the mandatory part you can also do this in the voluntary part so if you only want to do the mandatory part the only the only po data points you need to populate is 
this here, general information, this is easy. It's something what you have. It's uh, just about information about the AFM fund and so on. So, so easy, easy stuff. And these data, those data points here, you see 80 data points for mandatory Annex 10 uh, reporting. And here, 165 for the Annex 12. Um, I'm aware that uh, uh, Marian mentioned other numbers, uh, so I think it was like 88 and uh, 100 something else, but depending on how you count it in a technical way, obviously you can have different different, different numbers. But I think um, uh, those are the, the, what should be clear is the, 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 if you want to do the minimum for the insurance investor, then you should populate especially these data points, these and these. So. If you want to do more, then you're more than welcome, obviously, to also provide the voluntary uh, parts um, 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 for Annex 10 and Annex 12. So now, how does it look like this? If you look at the specifications, you will find it, you will see it like this. So those of you who are familiar with um, other reporting templates will not be surprised. Uh, you have an ID, it's the field number. Um, then you have the description. The description is just a copy paste from the regulations. So for example, if you open the regulations, you'll find exactly this value in monetary amounts of derivatives in monetary amount for example right so it's just a copy paste from the regulation so it's exactly mapped to the regulations uh, then here you'll see where it comes from just in case you want to understand uh what the legal basis for this is so a10 additional denominator means it comes from annex 10 of the uh, uh, from the uh, table additional denominator and then you can see here um how to populate it so um, uh, floating decimal means it's just uh, well it, it's a number essentially and here's an example how it could look like okay and the same you see here for the annex 12 so this is annex 10 data points this is annex 12 data points um now um if we move on um this is not the report this is a guidance for the report it's a technical guidance how does the report look like the report looks like this so basically, it's just one line. It's not something you would, you know, print out and hang on your wall. Uh, uh, it's not a, it's not a, a beautiful uh, sort of uh, reports with charts and so on. But it's something you can you can use uh, for a, for a more, let's say, um, um, uh, visualized report. But in any in any case, uh, you see here there are two lines. One is essentially just those fields. So field field names. So the fields we had before is this here. Yeah. And the other one is your data. So if you have one fund, let's say it's a dummy fund, then you would report here the values in just one line. So you just provide one line basically to the investor for your fund. Um, usually you do this on the share class level. So if you have multiple share classes, you would have to do one line per share class. But if you have only one fund where the investor is invested, you would do it per, um, on the fund level. So that's that's what we came up with. And um, um, I think that those of you who are struggling with providing data or thinking how to provide data, this could be a good uh, sort of uh, uh, interim solution uh, uh, before um, before something else is released, hopefully on the EU level for the next year. But for now, that's what it is. We're not aware of anything else what is out there. So this could be used as a good um, um, as a good sort of a common denominator. <laughs> we spoke about denominator, so this this could be a good common denominator for this reporting period. 2023. So what is, and this is my, my last point, and then we'll open the, um, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll open the Q&A session. And um, what could, what do we expect going forward? Because as we said, it's only a starting point. Uh, so hopefully we'll expect something in the ET or at least on the FinDirex level. This would be great because it would have obviously a wider reach as an interim solution in one national association like uh, like BIS. So hopefully there's going to be something next year. Uh, uh, but if you do something based on the current template, it's not wasted time because the data points will be the same. So no matter on which level it will be introduced, if you do this, you'll have all the data points even for a future template. So it's not, you, you'll not lose any time or, or resources on it. The second point is, um, Will there be new data points as well in the template? Uh, pretty sure, yes, because um, as you as you see here, um, the, the the current template only includes Annex 10 and 12, so for insurance companies. Um, if there is also more appetite and demand from banks, from asset managers, who, who are also NFRD investors, obviously it will have to ex be extended for this as well. Um, then. Um, the ESG journey is only at the beginning, and we already know that there will be um, 
a new data points, either based on interpretations, because right now, for instance, there are some data points where it's not clear. Is it based on revenues or CAPEX or on both? So if the interpretation is that uh, you need to split certain data points in multiples, so for example, we have one data point, it's not clear, is it revenues or CAPEX? Now auditors start requesting it to be revenues and CAPEX, so all of a sudden you'll have multiple data points. You'll have to multiply, so duplicate them so that you can report them on, 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 on the CAPEX and OPEX uh, and revenues level. And last but not least, the regulations is changing. So not just the interpretation of the existing one, but also there is new regulations. Um, currently, there is a discussion about including PAI under CSRD and ESRS and so on. So you, you also have probably more data points. Maybe they'll maybe they'll converge with EET somehow because you already have PAIs and so on. So things will, will be uh, uh, fluid. This we can say for sure. It will not stay as it is. Um, and this brings me to the end and, and to the conclusion, um, uh, saying that um, what we have right now is an interim solution. We hope this interim solution will be something which will be established on the EU level for the next reporting year. For this year, you can use this solution here. And um, if you if you use it, you will not waste or lose time, because if you do it, you will do exactly unextended 12 for your insurance LPs. Um, it will be very easy to remap it to also other data points going forward. And um, it's, 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 it makes sense to, to, to uh, sort of keep up to date uh, uh, because um, interpretations will change, regulations will change, uh, templates will change. So uh, it will not be a static process. We are only at the beginning. And with that, I would like to end the presentation part. Um, also say great thanks to, to Anya and Marian for sharing uh, deep insights uh, from the LP perspective, because that's, that's the reason why we're doing this actually. Without LPs, we would not we would not be doing this. We are doing this for the LPs, so now we know exactly how LPs think about it. So thanks a lot for this. That was extremely insightful and helpful. And now um, I would like to use the opportunity to ask the audience for any questions or remarks you may have. Also, any comments, criticism, feedback, anything you may have, please do share this in the chat window. Yeah, thank you very much, Igor, uh, for the work you've done for the development of this um, um, template and this suggestion. And also, thank you very much uh, also uh, to Anya and to Marian for uh, sharing their um, insights. So far, no questions still. So uh, it seems to be that on this sunny Monday, everyone is uh, happy with our suggestions. Um, so last chance, probably. Um, so you type your questions uh, in the field, in the chat. Or if not, then uh, you can uh, um, reach out later on um, uh, to Jäger or me. Um, write us an email, um, write us in our member portal, reach out to uh, ILH. So. And join our working group in the um, and join the group, yes. obviously, where we're working yep. on the ET uh, suggestions. And this um, template was developed in the BAI working group and the consultation of uh, BAI members, but also LPs as well. Sure. We are always interested in, in uh, some kind of standardization and, and uh, templates uh, to exchange data uh, between our industry and investors. So uh, if ever there are some investors who are interested um, to join our working groups, uh, highly welcome. So um, it seems that uh, everyone is really happy with, uh, and, uh, with uh, uh, Regarding the, the 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 time, I would say um, thank you again, and for a happy Monday. Thanks so much. See you soon. Have a good week. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye.